like your hat, Alan. I wore it for you. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate couldn't it. find your tea, Linda. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. I'm drinking my tea. <laughs> you can't tell, but cheers. <laughs> All right. Cool. Okay. Should we kick it off? So we are uh, absolutely on time and we'll wait for a couple uh, for more folks to join or well, they will, they will join as they, as they do. Um, great. Well, I would like to, first of all, thank everybody for signing up. Um, I think we had a, a a mind-blowingly overwhelming response uh, to this panel discussion, uh, which I personally take as a as an incredibly good sign um, of the interest in the topic of regenerative agriculture. So, uh, really, really excited to to welcome everybody to our Kiss the Ground panel discussion. Um, I'm Linda Apolipsius. I am the executive director of Denver Urban Gardens. Uh, we are hosting this event. This is one of uh, many that we will be hosting with the intention to just start conversations um, around all topics relevant to uh, the environment, clean food, um, you know, and the many, many, many areas around that. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I hope just a real quick, I know we have a, a few people on here. Has everyone, raise your hand if you've, uh, if you watched the movie. <laughs> Okay. okay. There's my hand. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. And if you haven't, this is still going to be fascinating. I have no doubt. Um, so excellent. Glad to hear that. Um, also, I think Nico, um, we were hoping if people want to share where they're from uh, in the chat, we'd love to know who's on the call with us, uh, just where, where we have representation from. So please feel free to, uh, to do that. And then if you have questions um, as we go, please uh, populate those in the chat too. So the format for the evening, um, we're going to uh, have presentation from our three illustrious speakers. They're each going to speak for about 10 minutes um, and then we're going to open it up. Uh, so please send questions um, and we're definitely hoping that this will be a lively discussion. So that's, uh, that's what we got. So uh, just before we start, um, just have to give a little bit of plug for Denver Urban Gardens. So we are at Denver, shockingly based organization, <laughs> been around for 35 years. Uh, we have 188 uh, community gardens across the city of Denver, across six um, counties, and we have 17,500 gardeners in our network. Uh, we are very much focused on community driven um, gardening and uh, committed from the beginning to regenerative principles. So this absolutely uh, aligns with what Doug is all about. So, um, and at the end, we'll just put in some additional information where you can find out more if you would like. Um, but again, this is absolutely information share and conversation starting. So thank you again for coming. Our panel, uh, just absolutely thrilled and you know, just a little bit starstruck. Uh, so um, we've got three amazing panelists. Oh, don't blush, Alan. Um, so we've got uh, Jeff Moyer um, from the Rodale Institute. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with Rodale, it is the definitive, I think, resource on organic farming, regenerative farming. Um, it is absolutely very science-based, fact-based. Jeff will tell you uh, more, I'm sure, um, but an amazing resource just in general for you to go to. Um, Jeff, is a world-renowned authority in organic ag. Uh, his, his expertise includes organic crop production systems with a focus on weed management, cover crops, crop rotations, equipment modification and use, and facilities design. design. He is perhaps most well known for conceptualizing and popularizing the no-till roller crimper for use in organic ag. His vast experience and knowledge regarding organic farming has provided the media with a reliable source and perspective for information on current agricultural issues. He's been on staff at Rodale for over 44 years. Wow. He spent 30 years as a farm manager and director, was appointed executive director of the Institute September 2015 and became CEO in September 2019. He was project leader on the highly acclaimed Organic No-Till Project and is the author of the book on the subject, Organic No-Till Farming, Advancing No-Till Agriculture Crop Soil Equipment. 
He's past chair of the National Organic Standards Board and currently sits on the board of Regenerative Organic Alliance as board chair and the Soil Health Institute. Jeff is a founding member of the Pennsylvania Certified Organic, Pennsylvania Certified Organic, and has pat and is past founder and board chair of the Seed Farm, a new farmer incubator project. So we welcome Jeff. I'm actually going to do everyone's intros up front, and then I'll turn it over to the panel, and I will stop talking, um, just so you know who who was in the room. Uh, our next illustrious panelist is Alan Lewis uh, with Natural Grocers by Vitamin Cottage. Um, for those of you who are not uh, Colorado. Well, I guess you guys are all over the country. It's not even Colorado anymore. So um, one of the just extraordinary grocers out there who absolutely walks the walk um, and does the work that it takes to guarantee that good food is being delivered to the great people of this country. Um, Alan navigates government affairs and food and agriculture policy for natural grocers. Uh, natural grocers was founded in 1955 with over 160 stores in 20 states. At the federal, state, and local level, Allen engages on food, agriculture, nutrition, rural economic development, technology, biotech, cannabis, trade, and health issues. Described as a wily veteran of the grocery wars, he is active in several trade and advocacy organizations and is a fearless writer, speaker, and panelist. Um, and then we have uh, our third illustrious panel panelist, Judy Elliott, otherwise known as Jungle Judy. Uh, she is a member of the Doug team. She is a senior education specialist. She spent a lifetime implementing strategies that connect youth and adults to the experiential teachings inherent in garden-based learning opportunities with a background in horticulture and social work, specializing in high-risk youth studies, plus four years working with diverse cultural communities in Brazil, associated with Peace Corps. She utilizes an asset-based approach, passionately believing that every child and adult has the capacity to be a leader in their community when they are provided with the seeds for success. In her role with Doug, she developed and implements the Denver Master Composter Training and Outreach Program, was instrumental in helping to design a program that educates elementary age students about healthy bodies and healthy gardens, teaches practical horticulture classes for youth educators, community gardeners, and the general public, and firmly believes that gardens are the ideal milieu to bring together the wisdom of diverse cultures and generations. So, so now you know who we got. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty impressive bunch. Um, and they'll be speaking. Uh, so we're gonna, they're gonna speak in that order. Jeff is going to uh, give an overview of regenerative ag, um, what it is, the origins, how it differs from conventional uh, agriculture, as well as organic. Then Alan is going to talk to us about how to support regenerative producers and the realities facing producers uh, out in the real world. Um, and then Judy is going to bring it home to our, your own backyard, community garden, rooftop, or containers, uh, so that all of this stuff that is amazing but sometimes overwhelming, she's going to give us the tools for us to make the impact at home. Um, so without further ado, I would like to turn this over to Jeff to kick it off. Well, thank you, Linda, and thank you, Nico, for having me uh, as a guest. For me, it's this evening. For you, it's afternoon. I'm located in eastern Pennsylvania, sitting at the world headquarters of Rodale Institute. For those of you who don't know who Rodale Institute is or may have, have uh, not paid attention to the work we've done, uh, we are a nonprofit research and education facility with our world headquarters here in eastern Pennsylvania, but we operate in four different states right now. We have a research facility in uh, Iowa. We have one in the state of Georgia, and we have one in California. We also have a, a branch office that works um, in our development team located right there in Boulder, Colorado. So we have a Colorado presence as well. The work that Rodale Institute does is focused on organic and regenerative organic agriculture. And we do scientific research, as you mentioned in your opening comments, Linda, we try to put science behind the story of organic agriculture. And we work specifically to train farmers, uh, to transition farmers to become certified organic, or in this case, we're talking about regenerative agriculture, uh, certified regenerative organic. And you'll notice that we always link the word regenerative with the word organic. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge force out there in the world right now working to have regenerative be a standalone word without any sort of certification or standard. And we're concerned about that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. 
but Rodale Institute has been around for a little, little over, um, not quite 75 years, 74 years or so. Um, started by our founder, J.I. Rodale, who was, for those of you who don't know our story, J.I. Rodale was not a farmer. He was a businessman who happened to buy a farm. He was of Jewish descent. And back in 1939, he was looking at what was happening in Europe. Uh, his family came from Poland, looking at what was happening to the Jewish people in Europe. And he said, well, you know, the same thing could happen here in the United States. And so he wanted to buy a farm and raise his own food. And so he bought a farm, lived in Brooklyn, New York, moved to Pennsylvania, uh, moved to Pennsylvania for the summer, bought a farm. And his idea was he was going to raise his own food, take it back to the city and eat it. And that way, at least people couldn't starve him out. The challenge was he knew nothing about growing food. So he called in the experts who at the time from uh, our local universities came out, looked at his farm and I, can, I wasn't there, but I can imagine the comments went something like, well, Mr. Rodale, you want to be a modern agriculturalist. Uh, so you want to have a lot of inputs and you have a lot of outputs. It made sense to him until people started talking about what those inputs were. And those in inputs were salt-based fertilizer and synthetic pesticides. At no time, he said, did anyone ever talk to him about the soil. And he said, well, doesn't the soil have something to do with it? And they basically said, no, that has nothing to do with it. Uh, it's just inputs in, outputs out. And those inputs, he said, don't really make you healthy. So why would we use them? So I think it took somebody from outside of the uh, agricultural world to sort of look at this from a brand new perspective and start thinking about the soil as the main component that we need to keep ourselves healthy. Because he intended to eat this food. Uh, if you look at agriculture today, we have divorced ourselves completely from the concept that the food we eat and the way that food is produced has anything to do with our health. In fact, when I was able to sit on the National Organic Standards Board and, and spend a, a fair bit of time in Washington, DC and got to know folks at the Department of Agriculture, they would say, and this was under the Obama administration, so uh, uh, you know, a reasonably uh, receptive administration to the ideas that we're talking about. They said that the Secretary of Agriculture sits at one end of the table and the Secretary of Health and Human Services sits way down at the other end of the table and they're completely divorced from each other. They have nothing to talk about, don't yeah. even speak the same language. How did we get there? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. And so J.I. Rodale in his uh, naivete said, we need to link soil to our health and we need to start paying attention to the way we produce food. And um, he actually wanted to, he did not want to create the Rodale Institute. He wanted to fund research at various universities, but no one would take his money because they said, we don't want to do that kind of work. We want to do high input agriculture. And so he created the Rodale Institute as a nonprofit to do that research and education. And we've been involved with that ever since. Come along, uh, he passed away in 1971. His son, Robert Rodale took over and Robert was very concerned with the ideas around climate change, even back in the 70s and into the early 80s. And he began to look for a word that he could partner up with organic to express in greater detail the ideas around soil health, around animal welfare, and even looking at the concepts of social justice. And he coined the word regenerative agriculture as it pertains to the way we farm. Most people didn't like that word back then. They were really gravitating towards the word sustainable and sustainability. And Bob Rodale felt that those were very weak words, sustainable and sustainability. In fact, I've got a, a friend, uh, uh, Greg Bowman, who is a journalist and said one time when we talked about sustainable, he said, if somebody asked you how your relationship was with your significant other, and you said sustainable, uh, would they be happy or would they be sad for you? And I, I think it's a perfect way to look at that word. How can we relate to our food system and our personal health and the way we treat the soil as sustainable? Uh, regenerative is a much more positive word, but marketing people use the word sustainable, sustainability. Uh, every organization on the, on the planet has or had at one point in time a sustainability uh, committee uh, to advise them on how to be sustainable, and yet we certainly are not sustainable. That's it's, it's, a, it's a weak word. Marketing has pretty much played that word out to the point where it means everything and it means nothing all at the same time. And now they're beginning to look at the word regenerative. So it's exciting for Rodale's perspective to see that word become uh, pot used in the agricultural community and in the marketing world 
But then again, there's concerns about what people want to do with that word. They would love to put the stamp of status quo uh, under the word regenerative and then game over and we can just keep doing what it is we're doing. So there are many people that think using Roundup is, is regenerative. And cl clearly in our perspective, it's not. So Rodale Institute in partnership with several major brands launched the regenerative organic certification standard uh, actually just launched this past August, August of 2020. And we're seeing a, a great interest in the supply chain and moving in that direction as consumers, as uh, policymakers, as uh, CBGs, uh, you know, making food products are really looking for a way to differentiate themselves in, in the world. And sometimes organic doesn't really, while we are a strong proponent of organic, we don't, we want to build on that word. So we're adding some components to that word in our standard to encompass this idea of regeneration, mainly around three separate pillars. One is on soil health. If you look at the organic standard today, we can have organic hydroponic, which doesn't even have soil involved in the system at all. It could be an indoor growing system. And we really don't believe that that's the way nature wants us to produce food. And we lose so many of the components uh, of the soil that make us healthy. Um, looking at, for example, at ergothionine, and I would challenge all of our listeners this, this afternoon or this evening to look up the word, Google search the word even while we're talking, ergothionine. It's an amino acid that we're finding out to be the most powerful anti-inflammatory known to man. It was discovered in 1907 or 1917, something like that, but nobody knew where it came from or what it did. We're starting to find out that it has a huge impact on neurological disorders like autism, attention deficit disorder, and Alzheimer's, all of which are growing rapidly while we're seeing in our food systems, ergothionine levels are depleting at about 1% a year. So over the last 50 years, we've lost half the ergothionine in our diet. Also uh, seems to play a role in strokes and heart disease. So what are we doing as a society to improve ergothionine levels in our soil? Absolutely nothing. In fact, uh, using Roundup uh, kills the mycorrhizal bacteria and funguses that make ergothionine that produce it. So as we continue to rapidly uh, expand those synthetic materials into our food system, we're literally destroying the soil's ability to feed us. That's not regenerative. So we have placed this idea of soil health uh, along with organic, and then we, in our definition of regenerative and regenerative organic. And then we've also added in a component around animal welfare, because we feel it's really disingenuous to not to treat animals properly if they're going to be used in our food system. We don't have the, the right to do that. And yet the organic standard by itself is relatively weak on the, the issues around animal welfare. And then in the terms of social justice, the, the uh, organic standard as presented by the, uh, the USDA is completely silent on the issues of social justice and how farm workers in the system are treated as they bring what we hope to be the most wholesome food product to the table. Uh, we, we can't do that uh, without bringing those folks along in, in terms of the way that they're treated in, in uh, farm operations, not necessarily just domestically, but when you look at the international trade in, in organic, we probably have a more organic product that's brought to the U.S. shores from international sources than we develop within our own domestic production systems. So we need to be aware of that and, and think that through. So for example, if, uh, if we're buying uh, organic cotton clothing, we would like to assume that that cotton is not being harvested by child labor in a, in a foreign country, mm -hmm. even though it's certified organic, and yet this organic certification is completely silent on those points. So we add that to our definition of regenerative agriculture as we fit into our, our standard. So it's been a long road, a 75 year road to get to where we are today, but it's, it's really powerful to know that consumers are coming to the marketplace with a whole suite of values that they use in purchasing food and we want to be part of that e equation. So 
regenerative organic agriculture, as it, and especially as it pertains to the movie Kiss the Ground, where we start to be, think of not food as medicine, but soil as medicine. It's really the soil that is going to sequester the carbon and save the planet. It's really the soil that's going to nourish and feed our bodies so that we can uh, live productive lives. The food is just a connection between the soil and us. So G.I. Rodale, going back to him historically, in 1942, he wrote some words on a blackboard. He said, healthy soil equals healthy food equals healthy people. He wasn't a physician, he wasn't a scientist. He just intuitively knew that the way we treat the soil has a huge impact on our personal health. And now we know it also impacts the health of the planet. And we can sequester carbon in the soil if we change the way we farm. Uh, agriculture has never been considered part of the problem. And if you're not considered part of the problem, you can't be considered part of the solution. And we know that agriculture can be a large part of the solution in terms of planet health and human health. I think I'll stop there. That's great. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Thank you for all the work you do and continue to do. Um, Nico, if maybe you could share the white papers that um, Rodale has put out recently in the chat so people can continue their learning and please follow the work that Rodale does um, and support them if you can. Uh, cool. So thank you. Thank you for that great overview. Um, now we're going to move on to Alan. Um, Alan, if you would share, you know, the work you do um, and help, uh, help everyone understand, you know, what the producers go through and how we can support this movement um, to make sure it continues to thrive. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever you want to talk about. No, it's just so... As as we just saw with Jeff, it, it, everything is so complicated, so embedded in history and so nuanced that uh, I'm, I'm going to try to keep it a place that's um, more accessible for those of us who have ADHD and are having trouble following one more Zoom conversation. <laughs> However, so um, I want to dovetail with, with, with Jeff's story too. The Isley family started Natural Grocers 65 years ago. And not long ago, Maria Rodell came out. We asked her to come out and spent the afternoon with her. And we are talking about the generational aspects of each of our companies, one focused on agriculture, one fo focused on, on uh, nutrition. And of course, that's the same mission, uh, which was uh, how Jeff wrapped up his talk there. Uh, soil, food, and, and human nutrition and health are... are largely the same issue. So we, you know, getting into the organics and regeneration in soil, getting back to kiss the ground, natural grocers from the beginning when it started to sell food had to self-certify its farmers, which means we would go out around our stores, talk to them, see how they're raising the animals, whether they were using toxic pesticides or not. That eventually rolled up into the state certifying programs like CCOF in California Tilth in Oregon and a small uh, temporary um, group in Colorado. And then 2000, when the National Organic Program from the USDA finally went live, we kind of shifted all of our uh, energy into that and said, okay, if it's certified organic, then we will sell it in our produce section. And we started pushing all of our suppliers for all of our food to look at their ingredients and make sure that the ingredients all the way down to the smallest natural flavors were compliant with our standards for um, healthy food. Since then, we've established, I think, seven different very detailed standards that we enforce with our suppliers and the ingredients. And Linda, this is where we shift the market and create a supply chain. I'm gonna do a quick case study in a second on Thousand Hills beef, but the whole issue is, mm. um, Producers want to use regenerative practices. They're more expensive and they're more risky if you don't have a ready market for a higher quality, higher expensive, more expensive product, higher price product. So our job as natural grocers is to develop that consumer demand, teach about soil, teach about nutrient density, 
teach about the human microbiome and all of the interactions with environmental toxins that occur in your microbiome. And as Jeff said um, early in his notes, these are the things that are causing complex chronic disease. And, uh, you know, most people under 30 that I know are not 100% healthy and don't feel 100% well. Well, that generation was brought up in a slurry of toxins, and that is the glyphosate generation that introduced herbicides into their bloodstream in utero and then in, in their water, in their food, in the rainfall since then, and on their parks for that matter. So Natural Grocers is best seen as a nutrition education company. We sell crackers and carrots to pay for all of that, millions of dollars a year for a full-time qualified uh, nutritional health coach in the store, outreach, trainings, um, uh, one-on-one -on -one consultations, all of that, and kind of browbeating, to be honest, sometimes our customers in the store and making them feel guilty if they buy a cookie instead of a carrot, right? So we're not the food police, but we <laughs> are very heartfelt about this and, and they have to walk the talk. Um, where that led us is, especially in the meat program, bringing nutrient density, soil health, climate change, um, humane treatment of animals, improved rural economic vitality, and the idea that a farm family actually deserved to make money, that the farm workers and the families that created our food deserve to send their kids to college, to have adequate health care, to have secession planning so the, fa so the wealth could stay in the family. We're not talking health about being able to pay your bills for a few months if you get sick, right? Wealth with a very small W, but that's very much missing in the country right now and is fueling a lot of the anxiety and unrest that, that, uh, that, that we're experiencing. So the best case study about Kiss the Ground and Soul Health and the absolute necessity for livestock is, is Thousand Hills beef. Thousand Hills beef comes, uh, the cattle are raised in central Minnesota. Now these are old school conventional farmers. These are the people that are in this hilly, wet country, lots of ponds and streams. But when you go up on these hills now, there is no topsoil left. It's hard, sandy, rocky. There's no organic matter. There's a spattering of of, uh, of gnarly grass in there, but nothing that an animal could actually live on. They can't raise cattle anymore on the land. Now, I'm just going to stop and repeat that, and I apologize. But if you can't raise animals on your land, you've destroyed it so badly that it doesn't use enough carbon dioxide from the air and sunlight from the sun, to be able to create those sugars, put roots down and create a green mass that an animal can eat, that is where you're destroying the fundamental health of the planet. Not to mention that the grass that you can grow in rocks has so little calories and nutrition in it that uh, literally animals will starve on it. And that's what a lot of land in central Minnesota looks like. Now, we spend a lot of time up there. We have our video crew up there from time to time. These farmers have taken this big shift to use regenerative practices. They're all savory uh, certified for the land to market environmental outcome program. They're also American grass fed certified. Jeff, they're not regenerative um, certified uh, yet, but you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure we'd like to get them there. But what this means that there's animals back on the ground. They're always on pasture. They're, they're grass fed off that pasture with a little bit of hay in winter. They're not being treated with antibiotics. The flip side of everything positive I just said is that they're, we're not growing GMO corn. Well, they can't, there's no soil left. They're not being fed grain that is disrupting their natural digestive practices. Um, and they're not, dropping pharmaceuticals, antibiotic resistant microbes, and, and, and uh, 
uh, and, and other pharmaceuticals byproducts into the soil that have a whole nother set of cascading negative consequences for another movie and another panel. But what we're seeing now is that that land is regenerating quickly, that you can bring back the soil, literally bring back the soil, not bring it back to life because there is no soil, but inject life back into the rock and dirt there. And that's the recycling of the nutrients through the animal, the fermentation, breaking down the cellulose, all the things that humans can't eat, which ends up in urea and poop with the hooves breaking that crust. So now when there is a rain on those ranches, it doesn't turn into muddy waters in the pond. Now the rain absorbs into the land in a spectacular way. And if it runs off, it's running off clear and leaving the soil where it's meant to be. So this is that change. Now it's 60 to 80 ranchers. They would never have done this had not our customers said, we will spend $8 a pound for, for Thousand Hills 100% grass-fed, savory certified, American grass-fed, no antibiotic beef. But that wasn't enough. They had to understand this social, economic, and political interaction because by paying that correct price for a pound of hamburger, that is what leaves half of that at the farm gate. That allows people to feel secure. That allows them to reinvest in the farm. That allows them to expand, to expand their regenerative acreage. Um, natural grocers is one tenth of one percent of the retail grocery business in the United States. Um, it's not. It, it certainly is bragging, but it's not untrue to say we are at that point where conventional ag is ending and regenerative practices are beginning. And, we, and in that point, it's like where the forest meets the prairie and there's so much biological activity and change happening there, but we're where conventional is meeting regenerative. And by being the catalyst for this, for education, for investing in the product, for committing to that supply, we feel like we have a far greater impact than one tenth of 1% on the conversation. And those ranching families up there and all the people in that supply chain uh, are so thankful. A couple of things there though. This is a long-term commitment, number one. So they know they can continue with, to invest. They finally have excess production and they can sell to our competitors. You know, okay, yeah, it chips us a little bit. But on the other hand, that's exactly where we want to be, where there's excess production and excess demand for that product or adequate demand for that product. So more ranchers can participate and see the success there. The second thing is, in terms of walking the talk, we won't sell conventional, we won't sell meat from conventional cattle. So cattle that are grass fed till six months, sold to a feedlot, fed 70% or more grain, a little bit of roughage to keep them healthy. Then they have antibiotics for growth, um, anti-inflammatories there. They have all these other issues that are happening because they're so sick. Plus they're standing in 12 inches of wet manure their whole lives. Mm -hmm. It's a miserable existence. That, that reason we don't do that is that the, the ranches that are raising those cattle they can't make a market. They're selling off those calves at cost. So they have their day job and their second day job. They're being ranchers in a lifestyle that they love, but they can never make money because of the monopoly in the meat system. So we're circumventing that and saying, we're not gonna play that game. You won't find two or $3 a pound hamburger at natural grocers because what does it support? It supports a monopoly meat system it undermines the financial security of, of our rural producers. It introduces antibiotics and antibiotic resistance into the public health sphere. It creates manure lagoons and that, that, are, that contain all those pharmaceutical and, and the metabolites from them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a miserable system that we've opted out of. And we're very thankful and very proud of our customers who have opted into a regenerative system or the grass-fed cattling system 
that fixes so many of the problems that are, are highlighted right now. Um, it, let's just say in the news, with quotation mark, in the news, all the problems that we're seeing. Um, it also circles back to nutrition. I'm gonna to try to wrap it up because I know we're gonna have a lot of questions. It's better nutrition on the one hand and it lacks the public health consequences of antibiotic use, anti-inflammatory use, and all of the other problems associated with how we treat confined animals when we're feeding them. So again, $8 pound hamburger, but you know, we're not an affluent glam grocer trying to sell expensive gourmet stuff to expensive gourmet people. We live in our communities. We want everyone in our communities to be part of what we're, of what we're doing and be able to afford those things. Um, and part of their motivation, they tell us, is I can't afford medical care. Medical care is so dangerous now because it's so chemical focused. I will invest in that $8 a pound I will spread it over a couple of nights unless I have a big family, then it's one night and I won't eat it every day. And that's actually gonna improve my overall profile of my diet. These are big questions and big personal responses based on ability and finances and exhaustion and number of kids and the special needs and elders and babies and pregnancies and all of this. But we found this sweet spot where we can provide something reliably day in and day out that people know that they can rely on for the whole spectrum of concerns that they have. Um, I, I think I'll leave it at that. As you can tell, I was uh, the son of a preacher and sometimes I get going, although Jeff gives me a run for my money. Um, but um, I, I, and I did, uh, you know, not, I forgot to thank you, Linda, because this is really tough to pull off and I really appreciate you bringing us all together. It's, it's really important to have the conversations that we're about to have. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for that, Alan. Um, yeah, just again, hats off uh, to the work you do for decades and decades um, and slowly uh, we are changing the food system. Um, I gotta say the, I think the, the most ironic of this is the way that we're cultivating and growing food is, you know, <laughs> we're killing the planet in order to produce toxic nutrient devoid food and tasteless. <laughs> so it's like, there's just no winning in how we're doing it. And, and with the changes that you all are driving forward, um, the system gets back in balance. Uh, so it's, it's really good stuff. Um, okay, so now uh, we open the floor to Jungle Judy to to bring it, to bring it literally, bring it home. And uh, we're also there, somebody had asked a question about relevant to Colorado uh, yeah. environment. So she's definitely gonna speak to the challenges uh, that we face in Colorado growing food in a desert. <laughs> so over to you, Judy. All right, I was just noticing, Linda, that uh, question about Colorado climate. And I think I'm gonna open my very uh, practical, maybe a little bit less non-scientific, but, um, down-to-earth talk that addresses some of the things that I've noticed going on in Colorado climate that I think are really relevant to some of the challenges that we're facing now. Um, just out in my backyard today, or my front yard, I was noticing that um, I have emerging crocus. I have some buds on trees that unfortunately are starting to swell, um, and lots of greening up perennials. So for those of you who are not um, joining us from Colorado, although we tend to have people that are here from many other places, we are really a high desert. So our climate, typically uh, our soils are, are heavy clay soils. They're not the, the nice uh, loamy soil that we have near Botanic Gardens. And we are zone 5B here in Colorado. So we typically would hope to have it a lot colder. But what I, uh, what I noticed is increasing winds, increasing erosion increasing bare soils. And when we have bare soils, we don't have our typical tall grass prairie where we have these wonderful grasses that bend down with the strong winds we get that cover the soils. So one of the things that I wanted to, so uh, climate, although we're a, a high desert, we 
some winters we get more snow and more moisture than others. We typically still get only between about nine, and thir nine to 13 inches of usable water per year, which is an amazing thing for people who may live in Oregon or uh, someplace on the East Coast who try to recreate some of the things that we have that we can do here. One of the things that is most meaningful to me is a word that I call cover or lack of cover. And I think one of the big challenges that we have with bare soil is a lack of cover. And in typical agriculture, what you tend to see, whether it's large scale or small scale, is people grow a garden and they till it up or they dig it up at the end of the year and they take everything away. It looks ugly. We have perennials, they have dead stalks, we cut them down, we take it away. Uh, one of the programs that Linda mentioned that I do is the Master Composter Program. And by the way, Jeff, I had the privilege of being at Amaze, Pennsylvania many, many years ago for a week-long course in composting. So my roots to Rodale go way, way back. But when I start my Master Composter course every year, I start with a little side that talks about um, a story between God and St. Francis. And I won't bore you with all the stories, but basically it goes through an iteration of God saying, oh, St. Francis, you must be so pleased to see all the crops that the people are growing. And St. Francis says, well, actually, no, God, not, not, not really. Um, because we have people that are um, all those yellow flowers that you planted in the lawns, People are using this product that they call Roundup to spray on them and they get rid of them and say, and God says, oh my goodness, but why would they do that? They have such beautiful yellow faces and they bring in the birds and bees. Well, God, you better sit down. It's the suburbanites again. They just think it's really ugly. So they take it away. And then as the season goes on, God says, well, for goodness sakes, I've, I've given these, these green lawns and they grow at a certain time of the year. And, and then, then I produced a plug so that when the heat gets really high, they don't grow. God, you better sit down. What have the suburbanites done now? Well, to get those green lawns that don't grow anything else to grow, they, they have to plug it with many, many more chemicals so many more of those yellow flowers don't grow. But surely the lawns don't grow in summertime when it's too hot. Oh no, God, then they turn the water on even more to get it growing. But what about that wonderful crop? Don't they let it shade the earth like I produced in the prairies? No, God, I really need you to sit down because what they've done is they cut that. No, what is this then, a cash crop? No, sir, they put it in bags and haul it off. And what do they do? Do they sell it? No, sir, it ends up in a landfill. Oh no, I don't really believe it, but what happens in the fall then? I produce these forests of trees and I have these wonderful leaves that fall down to blanket and cover the soil. God, this may be the last thing because the suburbanites again, rake up the leaves, put them in sacks, haul them away, put them in landfills so that their gardens and their landscapes can be clean and free of debris. But what happens come spring? Sir, they go out to the big box stores and they buy something called mulch to cover the areas. And what does the mulch come from? Sir, it comes from the trees that they then chop down. So I bring that up to illustrate the, the concept of covering the soil. And I've been called to just to share a, a brief thing about how we bring these large principles of regenerative agriculture. We promote, first of all, composting. I teach the master composter course. It's a train the trainer course. I've done it for over 20 years. Normally in a regular year, I can have over 35 volunteers that give back over 2000 volunteer hours in our community gardens, in public classes, at farmers markets, in many micro classes that we do. Um, we promote in our gardens in-garden composting. And when we teach our classes, we teach people, we do not haul away things at the beginning of the year. So my master compost go to gardens 
and they teach people how to utilize those resources that they create so they're not bringing in sacks of other material but we're working with material that is created on site we also as we're working on designing our gardens teach concepts like creating walkways within our small plots most of our plots are no more than 10 by 15 and I think Linda shared with you, we have a network of over 17,500 gardeners, over 30 acres of soil, which is preserved from development, um, and over 180 community gardens. And in those small plots of 10 by 15, many of our gardeners have taken courses with us so that they create many areas for crop rotation within those 10 by 15 plots. So we're not growing the same uh, crops year after year in the same areas, even if it means just rotating the crops two or three four feet apart. But in those walkways where we invite our feet to come in and dance because we want people to come in and care for the crops, what we can also talk about is a wonderful process called sheet composting, where when people are getting that four foot long zucchini that they've forgotten, which somehow disguises itself under a leaf, we can do sheet composting and trench composting, burying, making areas of overgrown crops, of dry grass, of dried weeds, and create mini compost piles in those, in those aisles right within our garden beds where people can walk on. And then the following year, when we rotate our crops, we just move the areas a little bit over. So, we're not only teaching composting, and I don't know if this will show, I'm gonna hold it up to the screen, but it is homemade, homemade compost that, we're, that, we are, that we are making. This is backyard compost, which is unsifted, and we're making this from weeds and landscape prunings and non-meat food scraps and pet fur. We're teaching our gardeners to make this and to utilize this. In addition, what we're doing is we've partnered with one of our partnering organizations, Denver Recycles, to complete the loop. So what we're doing is we're working with them with their green cart system, which is um, a fee-based structure in Denver, where residents can uh, pay to have their food waste um, and landscape material carted off if they don't choose to do on-site composting. It goes up to A1 Organics in, in um, Kingsburg, Colorado, the largest commercial composting facility. It is composted there and then due to a partnership with Ace Hardware right here in Denver, it is bagged and sold right back to Denver residents as A1 Organics landscape-based compost. How wonderful is that for completing a loop? So we are composting in, uh, in our gardens. We are rotating crops. We are working very hard in Denver to implement a pay it system, a pay as you throw system, where the more trash you produce, it will no longer be free. Unfortunately, Denver trash pickup is still uh, free, but we will have weekly recycling instead of bi-weekly recycling. We will have a pay it system and the uh, green cart that connects to A1 Organics. In addition to that, what we're modeling is we are, we're stressing to grow, the importance of growing uh, appropriate plants for Colorado. So we're encouraging all of our community gardens to have perennial spaces that attract pollinators, that utilize what we call xeriscape tolerant plants. These are plants that live on lower water in our high desert whose roots remain in the ground and give off the, create these wonderful network of living roots to create mycorrhizal type uh, in, uh, of arrangements with huge fungal threads and give, give off wonderful nutrients. So in addition to that, we are teaching mulching, we are teaching crop diversity, we are, uh, we are teaching the use of pollinator plants and I think almost most importantly, we are making these trainings, these teachings culturally relevant. So we're working very much with a JEDI principle um, with the work of many of our, uh, of our program partners and our staff to make sure that we're not just putting across a message that would not be 
um, utilized by our, uh, by our many different cultures. We're learning about different methods of food growing, different methods of utilizing crops. I remember, I'm gonna share something which was a real learning experience with, to me. I work in a very um, a large African immigrant uh, cultural community, the poorest community in all of Colorado. And I remember going into the garden one year um, and dealing with a woman who came from, um, from Somalia. And as I watched her, she was carefully plucking off leaves of her winter squash plant. And she was plucking off more and more leaves. And I walked up to her and I said, I, do you, I, I'm sure you realize, or you, or you may, if you take off too many of the leaves, the plant does not produce enough food. And she said, Miss Judy, no eat the fruit, eat the leaves. At that point, I realized that I had a lot to learn about the way food was grown and utilized. So she taught me about utilizing leaves. She taught me about eating the weeds that I would um, normally, the red root pigweed, that I would normally pull up and discard. And she taught me very much that the healthiest garden is one that allows a mix, a mix of crops, a mix of people, a mix of watering styles, and most importantly of all, the ability to pause and turn over a leaf and find out the wonder of insects under the leaves, to sit down on the soil with a child who is just learning to garden and have them show you a worm and have them show you a centipede and have you show and have them show you the wonder of a ladybug of a ladybug egg underneath the leaves so i think what we're doing at doug is pretty extraordinary extraordinary not only with our network of gardens but in our ability to um, to teach people how to utilize different crops in different ways. I notice a, um, a question in the tap room, uh, in, the t in, the, in the chat room, an answer from, Al from Alan Lewis, we use cover crops all the time. Um, and we, uh, we do plant vetch and annual rye to cover the soil. So I think that I will leave it at that between our worm composting and our regular composting and our ability to share and listen. Um, that's what I had to share for you today. And I want to thank you so much for um, having me share this chat, this, this uh, platform with such experts. Great. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your wisdom. Um, you know, and I think the, the takeaway, well, a takeaway for me, especially since I've, you know, come into this world, you can apply this, these principles everywhere. I live downtown. I have a rooftop garden. I do container gardening. You can apply these principles to contain, you know, to any, really any environment, um, not all of them probably, but there's definitely bits and pieces. And uh, we also really approach a lot of this remote uh, with the permaculture lens as well. And just the more you learn about this, and I'm sure those of you who are already sort of schooled in this, it just, it just all makes sense. It just all feels right. And it's all, you know, regenerating and, and this creating this beautiful, uh, robust feedback loop. So uh, just super exciting stuff. So with that, uh, we're going to open the floor. I guess actually before we open it though, any, any comments from the panelists on anything, anything else you want to say or that any of your esteemed colleagues said that you want to comment on and then we can open it up to the floor. I just, okay. you know, Linda, I just love uh, one of the things that I, uh, I think is, um, goes across the board is that we're all recommending is, is regenerative agriculture, whether large scale or small scale, uh, apartments, gardens, is not a band-aid approach. It's a go slow approach. It's utilizing the wisdom of the soil to show us all the knowledge and it deals with cycles. It doesn't deal with a beginning and an end. And it deals with communities, common unity. We all join. Absolutely, here, here. All right, so let's open it up. Uh, Please post your questions in the chat. <clears throat> um, no question too big or too small and take advantage of the, all the brain power in the room. Hey, Linda, I would go ahead and choose somebody. Let's pick on somebody. It, it, go. <laughs> I mean, I will tell you that I learned so much from my neighbors. 
and I have a really good group of neighbors that we challenge each other to see how much we can grow for how long using only organic practices. And at the moment, I am testing wood chips, for instance, and they're scoffing at wood chips because they take so much nitrogen uh -huh. out of the soil when they decay. But I'm using the uh, bioreactor system where we're just, I'm just using fungus to break it down. Uh -huh. And then the fungal remains will be used in the garden to balance yeah. out the soil structure. And um, complete and total disbelief. I, I'm the cowboy on the street right now. <laughs> but um, I, I know I'll be successful eventually, but that's the kind of interchange that you, you, you can't do this alone and you shouldn't try. And frankly, the whole fun is building community around the garden and the gardening. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so we have some, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, Nico, who is our uh, sort of the wizard behind the curtain here, um, I've asked her to call out some questions um, from, the, from those coming in. Yeah, so I'll let the panelists decide who wants to um, start with Don Cameron's question. What is a good low water cover crop that is easy to find your dog's poop too? Great question. Um, it's why he grows a little bit of grass. So any, any ideas or suggestions there? I literally plant rye in my front yard. I don't have any grass, but the rye is great. It establishes in the fall. It lays very flat in like a six inch patch. Then when it gets warm in the spring, it jumps up really quickly and it's breathtakingly beautiful. And you can certainly find a dog poop in that flat rye all winter. Yeah, I would say uh, buckwheat is an easy cover crop to grow. It likes it warm, likes it dry. Uh, and then you can get a little more exotic and look at lupins or medics. Uh, they, they can do very well as, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Buckwheat's beautiful too. It is beautiful. Yeah. Okay, another question we have coming in from Brandon is, are there any community gardens that use rye as a cover crop in Denver? I'm concerned about gluten contacting the crops as it's a major allergen. Hmm. I don't know. Um, I know that we have, um, we have, uh, you know, Essentially, how many community gardens we have that are using rye, we recommend vetch and rye as winter crops. I can't give you a specific um, answer as far as how many. I have rye and vetch growing in my own yard right now as a cover crop, but certainly for people who are gluten sensitive, you might want to deal with something like winter peas or something like that instead of the rye. Um, I would also um, I tell you about an experiment that I did in my backyard, and this is not an not a cover crop, but I have uh, I'm down to one large dog. I have a uh, Great Pyrenees, and there is a new turf out or new new to Denver area called uh, Dog Tough Grass, and it's actually a variety of Bermuda grass. It is very very drought tolerant. You need to keep it away from perennial gardens, but it is. Absolutely gorgeous. You never have to mow it. It's extremely drought tolerant and my dog runs all over it. You can find, you just needs full sun. Um, you can mow it or not. Um, it is very beautiful. Um, so uh, dog tough, a variety of Bermuda grass um, and high country gardens in Santa Fe, uh, you, you can get it through their website. You can get whole trays of that. As a reminder, the, the rye doesn't, you don't need to let it go to seed. And trust me, if you try to make rye bread out of your own rye, you will be a miserable pup. You, you want to let that grow in, into the planting time in late May, in Colorado at least. But then you just lay that rye down long before it's created a kernel. So you're not really, I don't believe, introducing a gluten allergen into your garden at that point when it's just leafy greens. Right. I want to put another yeah, just, plug in. Oh, oh. No, I'm sorry. I want to put another <laughs> plug in for, for buckwheat though too. We, we grew that extensively last year and attracted so many bees as pollinators. The kids were amazed. And then we, being an annual crop, we just laid it down on the soil surface, made a little slits and planted right through it. Wonderful success. Okay. And I get my rye for about $1.50 a pound at Natural Grocer's bulk section. Mm -hmm. All of those, 
all of those seeds and grains there are, are active, uh, active seeds. So um, th there are a lot of good places and high country mowing is a, a, a good spot, but you don't have to make it very complicated either. If you just happen to be in any grocery store that's got a good organic bulk section, you can be successful with that. You can also overseed the hell out of your front yard, but I won't tell you how I know that. Well, the other hey, nice thing about a quick. Okay. Oh. No, I was going to say the oh. other nice thing about some of these cover crops is you don't have to till them under. If you yeah. let them go to their sexually mature and they flower, you you don't need a roller crimper like we're talking about in in big scale agriculture. But you can simply crimp them in your own front yard with uh, with your feet, with your shoes. Uh, you can you can crush them over. Uh, you can make a little crimper out of a piece of plywood or a two by four. It's real simple, and you can uh, terminate them in place and be a lot more regenerative, not to till the soil and, and incorporate it that way. And leave that root in the ground. Exactly. And that's also a so great I, way, I, as you're laying that rye down, or the buckwheat or whatever the cover crop is that you're laying down, it's a fabulous way of getting kids into the garden to trump on things and then have them plant something right in it. Great exactly. way of that. Yep. So I just want to interject here. Um, forum this exchanging of ideas is amazing um doug has has put up um a really great forum for people to share their experiences and uh tips called mighty networks so if you go to mightynetworks.com and type in denver urban gardens um it's it's pretty cool and you can sign up if you're related to a garden but otherwise it's really just a lot of sharing tips judy goes on and shares her wisdom as well um so that's a nice forum for for trading tips um I want to just call it Rodeo, Inst Rodeo Institute also mm -hmm. has a very dynamic Rodeo Institute has a very dynamic oh. website. Come to Rodeo Institute and our staff also answers questions, but you'll find a ton of information on cover crops there. So check it out. Absolutely. Yeah, great resources. Um, I wanted to just call out one one question too from from our own Rob um, Peo, who was asking about the USDA and kind of, you know, what what your take is on you know, they support conventional, they support, like, where are they at on supporting and promoting um, regenerative ag, just sort of in the, in the greater Uber policy perspective? You want me and to I'll, jump in? Whoever or? you think is best, sure. Uh, well, I can talk a little bit, and I'm sure Alan and, and Judy have some comments as well. Uh, yes, the USDA represents all of agriculture, as you see it across the country, as so they have a big job to do. They do uh, control uh, the word organic. They do not have any input into the word regenerative. I will say that there are segments of the USDA that are very highly in tune and focused on the ideas of soil health, but they have to do it in the context of this big agricultural picture. So it's, it's certainly challenging for the USDA to, uh, to direct the traffic around regenerative or regenerative organic agriculture. That's why it's incredibly important for consumers to understand what it is they want, make their decisions when they go to the supermarket, when they go to Allen's store and they're purchasing their products, they can decide what kind of agriculture they want. And then the USDA is just a service provider and they'll provide the services that farmers look for and demand. And so we all have a voice, we all have a role to play, and we should not depend on the USDA to solve all of our problems. They can do certain things, but there's other things they can't do. Uh, and, and we need to take charge on our own. Mm -hmm. Linda, you know, Ray Archuleta opens up the Kiss the Ground movie, and I've spoken with him a number of times at different events, and he spent 30 years in the USDA, in the Conservation Service, and the reason he's so happy now is he's no longer constrained by USDA policies. The USDA's problem in a nutshell is that they are designed since World War II to support large scale commodity crops for export and internal use and food systems yep. feeding and ethanol. And then they throw little bits of money, little bits of funding at rural economic development, specialty crops, organic and conservation and those are very honorable, intelligent, well-trained people that you'd love to spend a night with, spend an evening with, uh, but the bulk of the USDA works against them at every step. Hmm. All right, <clears throat> I, I see so many different kinds of questions. It's, um, 
interesting to know where to start. I think um, I, I'd love to ask this question from Kathy about, uh, I wanna begin backyard composting with food scraps. I don't know where to take compost that I make. Um, how can I research where a small ba backyard composter can recycle compost? Any tips around getting mm -hmm. started with backyard composting or how to, how to get connected into the system? Judy? Well, you know, I'm thinking of what we do in Denver, which may not be applicable. So one of the things that, that uh, I think there's a confusion in the general public between what is compostable and the finished product, which is compost. And we get the questions all the time, um, where can I bring my compost, okay? That is material that you're producing either in your gardens or food scraps from home that you either don't know how to utilize on site or you don't know if there is a, a, a compost facility or anything like that. And we have the policy um, in our dog gardens that we do not accept food scraps or landscape material from homeowners who are very much trying to do the right thing and decrease their carbon footprint and, and decrease greenhouse gases by, gases by bringing us their material. But unfortunately, we do not have the, the ability to manage all that material. So I would encourage people to get in touch with their, you know, their local Congress people and see uh, their local um, solid waste facility and see if there's a movement on board to start such a, such a program. Mm -hmm. I also know that there are small scale movements of people, I don't recall the name of the, um, I just got some emails a few days ago, about people that are attempting to start small micro networks in their neighborhood uh, where they would manage the bringing of organics and with the help of a few other people, manage those organics and create a usable product, offer classes, mm -hmm. and then get that material back to the community. Mm -hmm. So that's another suggestion. Great. And I just want to make a case for, uh, you know, I, I, as I said, I live downtown in an apartment for vermicomposting. So even if you live in an, in an apartment and you're container gardening, you can still do your own composting and just set up a worm bin and, you know, some wormish dark place like that. Um, it's, it's pretty great. Now what I'm, what I'm attempting to flash at the top of the screen <laughs> is a container of uh, worm compost. That, that I brought in, which mm. is in my basement right now. And this is, um, this is material normally during the season from, from May through mid-October. Um, it's out at our citywide compost demonstration site. And now the worms are in my basement in um, several uh, containers. The worms will uh, eat their weight in, um, in food every day. And my worms live in a bedding of uh, shredded up newspaper and corrugated cardboard. Um, and, and leaves. So we're keeping that material out of the landfill. I'm feeding them tons of non-meat food scraps. And within this space, they reproduce in this controlled environment inside very, very quickly. I can get, I can then go ahead and either share the, um, the worm castings with people, the sifted worm castings, the eggs, the mature worms with other people, with schools. This is a very viable, low cost system and in Denver, unfortunately, we need to, to do this inside from like um, frost mid to late October until mid, uh, mid uh, or la last part of April. And then the system can move outside in the, um, in the shade of a tree. But I want to second that. Vermicomposting is a great way of getting, using f your food waste and getting uh, material which is actually much, much richer in, in, in nutrients than backyard compost. Awesome. Let's move to back to policy again uh, with a question from Dana. What are some good policy resources and guidance documents that will or should guide what the Biden administration, uh, especially the USDA, but not only will or should focus on uh, to support regenerate organic policy ecosystems? I'll, I'll jump in and I would say that everybody should take a look at the Organic Farmers Association website. I see Alan's wearing his Organic Farmers Association uh, cap right now. Uh, Rodeo Institute started that organization about uh, four or five years ago, and it just recently, as recently as 
a week and a half ago, uh, is now created as a separate nonprofit. We were able to grow that sister organization. And that organization has a policy arm and has a lobbyist in Washington, D.C., uh, working on behalf of organic farmers. And anybody can join that organization. You don't have to be an organic farmer. You do have to be an organic farmer to vote on the policies that they work on but you don't have to be an organic farmer to listen to the conversation and be part of the discussion. And uh, you, can, you can add to the conversation, but you just can't vote on issues. But that organization certainly needs support and anybody that wants to join and, and, and uh, support them with their, their low cost membership, it, it's incredibly valuable. I encourage everybody, every listener to do that. Awesome. Great. <laughs> Anything else to add on that, Alan? <clears throat> well, I literally, when I've just had it with everything else, will go to YouTube and you start looking, just searching for compost or Ray Archuleta or Young Farmers or Rodale or gardening or whatever, you'll get a really good idea and a good visual for how people are doing things. Um, you, you can get steered wrong on there like anything, but uh, given that it's winter right now and you just want to imagine what you're going to do when the ground warms up, uh, there's endless resources and people doing things for different climates in different ways. And you match them to your own situation, what you feel like doing and what you think you can accomplish. Um, there's a note in the chat about, you know, what will Biden and the USDA do? Well, Biden already did it for eight years and it was largely a disaster and Trump just put the icing on that. So don't expect anything from Secretary Vilsack and President mm -hmm. Biden, um, or really the Green New Deal under this conversation, administration, but it doesn't matter. It's all in your hands. Right. You can do all of this on your own, in your front or backyard, and be successful in the next six months. Yeah, and all, po all policy comes down to being local policy. So. Uh, work with your municipalities to get the kinds of activities that you want going, uh, especially at the grassroots. You know, anybody who's willing to volunteer and jump in, I'm sure they'd be happy to uh, work with you to get that done. I was just going to ask uh, you guys to share, to kind of wrap up and share your call to action, but I think Jeff and Alan, you just did. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's um, anything more to add. And I think and if, if you have more to add, and then Judy, if you've got a call to action. Um, please yeah. share that too. I, I think my call to action is the way I live my life is, is each one of us is called to plant seeds of possibility. Um, and it, it takes one person to put their ideas, their plans into an action or some type of an action oriented thing that they're doing. Dreaming is not enough. Putting the blame is not enough. One person taking that footstep, joining with their neighbor, sharing their ideas, it is a movement. It really goes back to um, Alice, the Alice's Restaurant tape, you know? It is, it is a movement. Um, it's not up to the officials, it's up to us to recycle, to, to compost, to create those deep roots and those connections, not only in our soil. As we create it in our soil, we create it in our communities. If we don't speak up, it's not gonna change. Awesome. Yeah, people. People cool. need to eat. People okay. need to eat. Eat like the world depends on it. Yeah. I mean, we we all depend on each other. We have to uh, make our decisions on a daily basis. We all eat three times a day, four times a day, maybe twice a day. I don't know. It depends where you're at or what you're doing. But we make those decisions, and we make need to make them as conscious decisions. And if we want farmers to farm differently, if we want to sequester carbon, if we want people to be healthy, we have to support those people. Mm -hmm. We have to go out of our way, as Alan said, you know, yeah, $8 hamburger. But there's a lot of ways we can get that $8 hamburger into the hands of uh, and under the plates of people who can't afford that. There's lots of ways we can do that. And Rodeo works on those operations all day, every day with our community supported agriculture systems. We changed it around and we call it agriculture supporting communities. So we have ASC programs. We have double snap. If you buy uh, yep. organic food out of our programs in the state of Pennsylvania, you get, it, you get it at half price. So there's ways to do that. We just have to decide as a society that that's important and, and, and we can do it. But uh, you have to support farmers if you wanna make a change. 
Linda, we have a really important question to show up in chat about how to do this when you do not have any extra money. Judy, do you want, I mean, this is your. Yeah, you know, how, how do you, you know, I work with people. That's mo the majority of people that I work with have got no money. You use what's growing in your yard. You use the food that you eat to create the soil. You realize that it all starts with the soil. It all starts with one seed at a time. You grow diverse crops, not just a huge monocrop of corn. You plant flowers to attract beneficial pollinators. Um, you share the wisdom of generations. You talk to those seniors who have done this for years and years, who know so much. You talk to the immigrants who come with stories of how they planted. You don't attempt to do everything yourself. And you realize that knowledge and change grow happens slowly. You're not looking to put a Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. You're looking for a preventative type of an approach that says, Maybe this is the year that I learn and I try one new thing. Well, the other thing you do That's is you, you, look, you look for specific yeah. crops and products that are more affordable. Uh, and Alan knows more about this than I do, but I know organic carrots typically cost the same and sometimes less than conventional carrots because we've figured out how to do that organically and we got the cost down. Uh, organic potatoes, a crop that's literally grown in the soil. Uh, those of you who don't know what, how potatoes are grown, but they literally sit in the soil. And if you're a conventional farmer, you're treating that soil with chemicals and the potato literally sits in it. Uh, so select the crops that are most meaningful or that you eat a lot of. And yeah, maybe you can't afford uh, organic uh, snack foods. And, and I understand that. And I'm nothing against the snack food industry, but you just be selective on what's important to you. Milk, maybe. Uh, a lot of people select milk because they give it directly to their children and it's uh, not highly processed. It's, it is processed, but not, not so bad. So organic uh, milk, or you find those products and those crops that fit into your family's diet. Uh, if you eat a lot of potatoes or you eat a lot of rice, start with rice and maybe not everything else. So I think we can make those decisions consciously. Uh, maybe it means you don't download uh, a certain app uh, that month and you use that to, to, to add to your, uh, to your rice or your potatoes or something that you wanna change the way you eat. So we can make small incremental changes and, and look at how that impacts our life and the planet. Linda, I just want to say one last thing. All right. Oh. With my front yard yeah. garden, that's how I meet and interact with people, and it's super fun. Mm. And up, uh, far from people's imagining that Boulder's an affluent city, you know, I've got neighbors who are retired and on fixed incomes, struggling, and uh, you know, wor working against cancer and things like that. Just everyone stop and imagine when they can come by in June see me in the garden and I can say here take this and this and this and this and give them a big bag of fresh leafy greens. I can't eat everything that I grow and I'm not a great gardener don't get me wrong but that giving and that sharing and that abundance mm -hmm. that that I experience brings tears to my eyes and it took a couple of years to get a garden that will do that but I think that's what's driving Judy. I know it was what drives Jeff is this sharing component here. And all the other political and nutrition and soil and climate health uh, build around that key experience, right? Yeah. All right. Guys, we could probably talk for, for much longer. Um, and this, this conversation, I think, has been tremendous. And I want to thank uh, Jeff, Alan, and Judy uh, for sharing your wisdom. I want to thank everybody who signed up for showing up and asking the questions. And Nico, of course, for being the, pu the puppet master behind the scenes. Um, and my, you know, my call to action is, is kind of the same, is sharing. Um, tell everyone you know about this. Um, I gotta be, I am blown away when I have conversations with my friends and my family and I tell them, you know, hey, have you seen this movie? Let's talk about the food system. Blown away. People outside this sort of, you know, natural and organic world who, you know, we already, we've, we've done some of the work. Um, tell everybody, have them watch the movie, have them read the books. And I guarantee once people start to look under the hood, and really understand what's what's going on, but also the potential to take it into your own hands and make make the change yourself. 
uh, that's when we start moving the needle. So it's, it's at a grassroots level, it's, it's hand to hand, uh, you know, and uh, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, please, I encourage you if you wanna continue the education, uh, Rodale is just a wealth of knowledge, um, an incredible resource, uh, natural grocers, tech shop there and watch what, watch what they're up to. Uh, and then of course, Doug, uh, we've got lots of resources and education. And if you're in Denver, come join us. So thanks everyone. Uh, have a lovely evening and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch soon with, uh, with the next fun party. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Bye. All right. Thanks everybody. Take care everyone. All right. Thank you.